Welcome to Veritas. Greetings to everyone around the world and a warm welcome to another edition of Veritas at VeritasRadio.com. I'm your host, Mal Fabregas, and I sincerely thank you for joining me once again. And if this is your first time or your truth journey brought you here, welcome home. And if you want to expand your mind and get all the truth, but listen to every program, all parts, just go to VeritasRadio.com and Subscribe. You'll get your login immediately, and we'll enjoy hundreds and hundreds of hours of truth. And if you want to get in touch with me, want to be a guest on this radio program, or have a guest suggestion, or simply have feedback, I always love to hear from you. Click on the contact button of our website. And tonight we discuss the real meanings of the Tetragrammaton and the word Elohim and how the world has been duped by those who turn things upside down. How this name game is part of the dialectic, a mechanism of the fallen that has been used to control us from the beginning. The real context of the Bible and genetics and how this is hidden within allegories all throughout the Bible. Why it is crucial to use the logograms of the cuneiform to understand the meanings of the stories in the Bible and why no pastor knows this fact. What is the meaning of the word apocalypse and how it's happening right now? How the soul is incarcerated within the DNA and how the elite want to keep it that way. And the real agenda of CERN that no one is talking about and how it is connected to the crucifixion and a cycle of death. All of this with Dr. Scott McQuaid an internationally acclaimed author and lecturer known around the world for his research into ancient texts. And since he's a veteran of this radio program, he does not need a formal introduction. Dr. McQuaid has only one goal in mind, teaching the truth so you can be free. And his website are linked right on ours. And directly from Mount Vernon, Ohio, I'm privileged to welcome my friend, Dr. Scott McQuaid, back to Veritas. Hello, Scott, and welcome back. Well, hello, Mel. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. It's my pleasure. It's been a couple of years, and you always come up with new information, new research, and tonight it's not going to be an exception. So I'm really looking forward to enlightening me more, to removing the veil, and to give definition to the real meaning of certain words that have been placed in our psyche, but they're... They seem to be incorrectly placed there for a reason. Is that correct? That is absolutely accurate, yes. You know, the the powers that be that govern our world, uh, I'm talking at a very high level, they know as a fact that the power of the word or the control of the word is everything. And this this bleeds over into Christianity in another way, what they call the Bible the Word, or Jesus the Word, and different things like this. And these kind of these kind of things have found their way into our our uh, religious vernacular and in our everyday vernacular. But the fact is, the power that they wield comes from controlling words, and the Bible intimates this. But it's very important to understand how to un understand the Bible. And I, I guess before I, I really get going here, I, I want to say something that I think is really important to your audience, and that is um, the work that I do uh, involves uh, understanding the words in the Bible and the Sumerian language, and I have uncovered a tremendous amount of information from the Bible. And I know that, <clears throat> pardon me, there's a cross-section of your listeners they come from all walks of life, Mel. Some are religious, some are not. Um, right. But one of the mistakes that some that so many people make is they they think that the Bible is simply a religious book, when in reality the Bible, as I've discovered over tens of thousands of hours of in depth research and exegesis, is a literal treasure trove. 
of information that has been compiled over thousands of years. And it's like a powder keg, and it's extremely important that we understand what the, these books within the Bible and these stories are trying to tell us. Some people, for instance, will say, well, you know, the, the story of Jesus, for instance, that's a, that's a retelling of older stories that come from, uh, the uh, Babylonians and the Sumerians and the Greeks and the Romans and others about, uh, the Savior God that was born of a virgin and that died on the cross and that uh, rose again with Mithra and Kingu and Dionysus and Horus and all this. So we're just going to discard this. And they throw out the Bible with the bathwater, so to speak. Well, that is a terrible mistake to make. The question we need to be asking ourselves is, why have the powers that be that control the word, meaning you can say the, uh, the Bible. When I say the word, you can think of it as the Bible, or you can think of it as just words. Why have those who control the word gone to such great lengths over the millennia to repeat these stories in the different religions and the different cultures. And it is because there is a power greater than them that compels them to tell us the truth. They are held accountable by an ancient law that they must give us the truth, even if it's done in a shrouded manner. And I'm here to tell you that the story of Jesus on the cross and all this, and other stories in the Bible that are repeated from ancient cultures like the story of Adam in Eden, the story of Noah, the, st- the story of, uh, uh, of um, Mordecai and, and Esther, which is Marduk and Ishtar. Um, all these different stories and many more are repeated because they contain incredible, life-changing, and emancipating truth within them. The problem is, and I, I tell you, that I say this in all humility, but it's a fact – the truth of these stories has been hidden for thousands of years until I developed the method of exegesis to uncover the meaning of these stories. And I realize that that may sound like a bold statement to some of your listeners, but you see, these things were foretold. They were foretold to be unveiled in other cultures predating the Bible, but they're Um, They were told to be unveiled at the time of the end within the Bible also. Let me ask you this. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm so glad you're opening certain certain doors. And I don't mean to for anybody to get offended tonight, folks, because what we want is the truth. And I'm I'm sure you're you're mentioning Mordecai and Esther being Marduk and Ishtar. And we can talk about Horus and Isis and Jesus Mm -hmm. and Mary. But the Bible has 66 Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a Bible scholar, but 66 books in total, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Right. But why is why is it that certain material or additional books, take the book of Enoch as an example, why isn't this book included? Who decides if there's such a thing as the Word of God to remove material that was intended to be part of this collection of books? Why? Well, see, that's an excellent question. Because if you ask Christians about the Bible, they will say that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Right. And that, and they say that, you know, you cannot take away or add to it. Because it's that's largely taken from a verse in Revelation that says, you'll be cursed if you add to or take away from this book. But that was in reference to the single book of Revelation itself. Because at the time when these things were compiled, they were not a single body called the Bible. They were in scrolls and manuscripts that were separate from each other. They were compiled to create a codex or a canon that we now call the Bible. And if it were really true that we can't take away or add to the Bible, well, Second Timothy 2.15 would not be accurate and says, in order to be good workmen that are pleasing to God, that do not need to be reprimanded by God, we need to rightly divide the word of truth, which is the Greek word orthotomeo, and it means to cut. Furthermore, if it were actually true that we couldn't take away from this this codex or this canon of material, then the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Trent, and other councils that have met over the centuries would not have removed entire books such as Enoch and First and Second Esdras and Jubilees and Jasher, many of which are actually spoken of in the Bible, but they did. And they've taken it upon themselves to do that. Um, so, 
you know, we, we are left with what we have now. And also, actually, we can look to those other books too. Those books are available to us. But what I'm here to tell you is that no matter which of those books you study, whether it's something that's outside of the Bible or still in the canon of Scripture, the truth of these stories is absolutely unobtainable without going back to a more ancient language, and that is the Sumerian and the writing of the cuneiform. The Bible also tells us this. Jeremiah 6.16 uh, says that Jeremiah told the people that they were not to go into the ways of Babylon, which is where we are right now. He said, instead, seek the old path, wherein is the good way, where you'll find rest for your soul. And this is a, this is a reference to an ancient path. The word old there is olam, and it means ancient, but it means enduring. And he wasn't talking to Christians. He, he was, this is a, a message for humanity. Asu, or who Christians call Jesus, also reiterated this same mandate in the New Testament when he said that we were to follow him because he was the good way and he would give us rest for our souls in the book of Matthew. He is the same one Jeremiah was referring to as the ancient path because the book of Isaiah refers to him as the ancient of days. But what does this mean? He was the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he was a personification. This is extremely important to understand. So what he was actually saying was, follow the truth and you'll have rest for your soul. And again, he was not talking to Christians. Absolutely not talking to Christians. They like to think that he was. He was giving a message to humanity because he knew a secret that the powers that be also know, which is why they've gone to such great lengths to hide the truth from you that will provide rest for your soul. And that secret is your soul is in prison. It is incarcerated in the most literal sense that we can imagine. And the bars of your prison are your DNA. This is what he was referring to. And those who wrote those words and attributed them to him, calling him, calling them the truth, knew this long, long ago. And they understood that our captors control the word, thereby control us, because we are literally assets to them. And this is one of the just mind-blowing things that I am coming across in my research is the fact that we are, we were manufactured to be an asset and we are assets to the powers that be. So let me, let me go back a little bit, if I may, Mel, and, and kind of provide a foundation for this so your listeners can know beyond the shadow of a doubt, uh, where I draw these things from and, uh, that they are true. We are told, again, we have a story in Genesis, beginning in the very first chapter of the Bible, about creation. And this same creation story was told other places too, in the Hindu texts, in the Babylonian texts, and in the, in the Jewish texts, and in the, in the uh, Sumerian Enuma Elish. It's the same story. You have Adam in the Bible, who is Adama in the Sumerian and Babylonian text. You have Eden in the Bible, which is the Eden in the Sumerian text. You have Adam being created by a potter in the Bible. And you have the uh, story of Adam being created in clay pots in the Sumerian text, which are created by a potter. And you have all of these similarities except the one distinguishing thing about uh, these stories, the one thing that separates the biblical rendition from the Sumerian rendition, is the name of the Creator. And this is one of the most important points that humanity can ever understand right here. Because it is, it's extremely elucidating, and it cuts through the misconceptions like a hot knife through butter. So let me explain what is going on here. The figure that is creating man in Genesis 1, the name of th- these figures is called Elohim. 
there's a problem with this though because okay. that word Elohim is is translated as God, and that word never means God, ever. It means angels, rulers, judges, and um, magistrates. Okay, and and gods with a little g plural. I was going to it say never, it's not singular; it's plural. Absolutely, and not a reference to God as the supreme being, but a little g in plural. Well, that should be the first red flag to people who are truly interested in knowing the truth and want to find out what's going on here. Um, so these entities say, as you go down through that chapter there, they say, let us, again, they're referring to a body of individuals, body of entities, let us make man in our image. And the very next verse says, so they created Man. And people say, well, Dr. McQuay, what is the big deal here? You're just, you're just giving an overview of man's creation. No, no. There's some very specific things that are happening here. There's a, there's a reason why two words are used. The first one is make. The second one is create. They asked to make man. Like a child would ask for something from their parent, uh, uh, a cookie, let's say. Because they did not have the authority to bring about mankind, to manufacture mankind? The answer they got was no, because the next verse reads, so they created man, which is another word in the Hebrew. Make is asa, and create is bara. So they asked to asa make, but they ended up bara, creating. And here's why that is so important. When we go to the end of that chapter, It says, so God looked and saw that everything they had made was good. This is a problem because man was not made, man was created. So what happens to something that is not good or suitable for their purposes? Well, if you go to the very next verse in the beginning of chapter 2, or it could be the end of chapter 1, depending on what version of the Bible you're using, there there are some things going on here with man. And it's hidden, though, in the text, within the word, once again. Because the next figure that comes on the scene here, known as the Lord God, often terribly mistranslated as the Lord God, Jehovah, or Yahweh, takes man from the dust. And the word dust there is literally afar, A-P-H-A-R, which means ash. It means ash. So what's going on? Where where does this word ash come from, and why do they translate it as dust instead of ash? Because they did not want humanity to understand that there was a great destruction. As a matter of fact, a cyclical destruction that took place at that point in time in that chapter. But this is the case. Man was taken from the ash. And another piece of evidence to show that this is the case are the words describing what this so-called God did after creating man and the world and other things. And those words are uh, rest and rested and blessed. And these words, although there's three of them, rested, blessed, and I think uh, there's one more, they all mean the same thing. But they're all translated in three different ways. They're translated as uh, rested and blessed, and blessed, and the other word that I can't remember right now. But they all mean to exterminate. Every single one of them means to exterminate. So man not being good was literally exterminated. Now, this flies in the face of traditional Christian views, okay? But it's the same story that's told over and over and over again within not just the Bible, but within the text and the traditions, the cultures and the religions that precede it. And this is really what I wanted to talk about most of today is this cycle. We live in a cycle that has been hidden from us. Now, before you go there, if I might... Because yes. some of the things that, that, that you discussed prior to saying this, for example, that our bars are a DNA. And I'm yes. thinking of, of, can we really change our DNA? And I think of the word epigenetics. 
which does not, uh, you know, really change the DNA. It alters it by literally changing the chemical makeup. For example, you have grandparents who die at the age of 40, then the son dies at 40, and then the grandson says, I'm going to die at the age of 40, because they were told stories. Those stories verbally, what we have been mm-hmm. seeing lately in, in, in the science world, scientific world, that DNA can literally be changed with words. So epigenetics mm-hmm. can actually change right. your word. Are you talking about this, the media, what we're exposed to, all these words and the language that we use is mm-hmm. the tool and the weapon they're using to change our DNA? We are literally viruses. Uh, the definition of a virus is a nucleic acid wrapped in a protein shell. Our skin is all protein and we have nucleic acid in us called ribonucleic acid. We are literally the walking, talking, breathing definition of a virus. And viruses are bro- are grown in a Petri dish in media. The media that is used is typically called auger. Auger is a word, it, it literally a word in the cuneiform, which means an irrigated field, which is what the word for garden, which is gan, in the Hebrew means, an irrigated field, in reference to Eden. When the Bible says that the Lord God put a garden in Eden, it is a reference to a garden being placed in or on the earth. The earth is a is Eden, just like the earth is Israel. The earth is Babylon. It's all these different um, metaphorical names for the earth itself. So, to answer your question, the word is what they are controlling. It's called media. Whether you look at it as um, radio, for instance, to use something close to home, to use uh, the idea of movies, music, television programs, it's it's the media in which they are growing us. And all of these things are inextricably linked to the word. So when you hear of a virus being grown in a Petri dish in media, we are one and the same as that. The virus. We are literally being grown in a petri dish. And this, you know, we could go off and talk about the flat earth theory and all this. The, the earth, the earth is, the earth is not really flat. It is flat-ish, if you will. If you, if you take a basketball and you cut off the top three quarters of it, you have what is called a, uh, a, a mortu, mortuarium. Mortu, mort, excuse me, a mortarium. It's called a mortarium. And this is the idea that we get uh, the, mo- the idea of a mortar from. You've heard of a mortar and pestle, True. right? This is something a pharmacist use, uses to grind things, to make drugs. Well, this is, this is the earth. The mortarium is what we're living in. It's, a, it's a kind of a, like a – think of a little saucer, if you will, okay? And this is – you know why in the book of Job, for instance, uh, Job talks about there being glass in the sky because, as geneticists and biologists know, the firmament. Anybody, uh, yes, yes, uh, absolutely. There is a lid on a petri dish, and this is where we are. I didn't expect you to bring the flat Earth subject up. I know this this is so polarizing these days, and folks, yes. as you know, I'm in the middle. Just because I discuss the topic doesn't mean that I'm Either way, but one thing I can tell you, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I have never seen an image of Earth being provided by all the various space authorities around the world that convinces me that they're real. They're mosaics, they're uh, different composites, they're CGI. So what you're saying that the Earth could be like a a third, cut the the third of a basketball, why is it that we're not seeing that uh, by our various satellites that are up there? Whether why we're not seeing it with the satellites is that right? What correct. Well, the, all like you mentioned a little bit ago or a minute ago, the, all of the pictures taken from the satellites are composites. They're aggregates of of pieces and parts of pictures, so they can they can put them together in any way they want. But this this dish is also enormous. It is huge, and so you know from our perspective, it could seem like a globe or like a spheroid. Uh, but it's it's actually a mortarium. Um, this is why the Bible tells us. Okay, what did I the Bible say about the 
this well, the, the shape of the of our planet or plane? Well, well, <laughs> it's it calls Eden a step or a plane. Okay, a step or a plane is abs- you know obviously a flat area. The word Eden is not in reference to the garden. Okay, the word Eden, in which the garden was placed, is a reference to the earth. And Eden itself means a plane, and a plane is a flattish area. It, there's, you know, it undulates like other places on the earth. It's not like a piece of paper laying on a, on a desk. It's flattish. It's saucer. Like, uh, think of a little a milk saucer or something. Not a bowl necessarily, but a like a you know a saucer. But this is why the Bible tells us we are dead in our trespasses, <laughs> okay, and our sin. I'll, I'll get into this a little bit here. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of people who talk about the flat Earth, are, I know, go through flack. They they are ridiculed and you know <laughs> and chastised and all this because people are just we're brainwashed. We're, we're ex- people have no idea. The extent to which they've been brainwashed. It is the intent of the powers that be to do everything within their power to cover the truth. You see it in chemtrails. They use the chemtrails to cover. No, well, stay, and, stay with the flyer for a moment. What is the first thing you see when you go to school, even kindergarten? The first thing that you see is a globe in the classroom. Yeah. That's exactly. the very first. So if all of a sudden somebody tells you, well, you know, take Neil deGrasse Tyson. Who says mm-hmm. that Earth is not round is an oblate spheroid? Well, show me a right. picture first of all, because all the right. images I'm seeing show the continents, different sizes, different shapes. You have right. the the uh, the Peters, you have the Mercator. There's so many different ones. Mm-hmm. But if I can see a picture of the Earth, then why don't we make that decision ourselves? Right, right. Well, you see, this goes back to the fact that we don't have a proper context. It, you can take the scientific context that's been given to us through the educational brainwashing system. Okay, you can take the religious context that's be give, been given to us through the religious context, or the religious system. Uh, neither one of these are suitable because they both suggest that the earth is round. And this is because the powers that be that govern the world – created the scientific process, created religion. The Hermeticists created religion. You know, Jesus didn't establish Christianity. Christianity is a Hermetic philosophy. As a fact, uh, the Apostle Paul was a Hermeticist. I, my first book, Blueprint for Bondage, I talk about this. This is what prevented me from being able to take my last class for my doctorate in seminary because the dean and others didn't like the fact that I was presenting this fact that the primary the author of, of most of the books of the New Testament was a hermeticist, meaning a Freemason. And so I had, I had to finish my last class elsewhere. But they, they've given us these contexts that are false to suit their agenda. And this is why we also have to have a proper context when it comes to understanding why the earth is here. Okay, Christianity, for instance, and not just Christianity, all the religious systems will say that God created it, like all the other planets. That is absolutely false. The true creator did not create the earth any more than the true creator actually manufactured man. Elohim, as I got done telling you a little bit ago, does not mean God in the true sense. Neither does the one operating behind the Tetragrammaton in chapter 2, which we can get to soon, which we should talk about. These entities manufacture the earth for a very specific purpose. The Sumerian creation story, the Enuma Elish, in chapter 6, tells us clearly that the earth was manufactured, was pressed together from the remnants, from the pieces, the rubble of another planet called Tiamat. And Tiamat was destroyed in the cycle that I started to talk about at the beginning here. Which is allegedly the asteroid belt. Yes, the, the remnants of Tiamat that were not used for Earth still are in the Kuiper Belt there. You, you can see those. And this is why there's a gap between the planets there. And so they took these pieces and parts and pressed them together. Well, they didn't do it in a sphere-like uh, shape. They did it in a mor- mortarium, the mortarium shape that I was speaking about earlier, which is a Petri dish, because the purpose of creating the earth was to grow man so you know when we have this context which was the original context 
which is the context from which all of the stories in the Bible were taken, we can start building our understanding of life, of our existence, of the Creator, and we can understand where we came from, who put us here, what we're supposed to be doing, and how to escape this prison. And one of the primary things we need to understand to begin this journey is who these entities truly were. And I think we should go back to chapter 2 in Genesis so I can explain a little bit about the the naming that goes on here. Now, before the, you do so, because I know we, we yeah. have to get into the Tetragrammaton to put the foundation forth, but I have to mm-hmm. ask you, because this is a question that you ask any Christian, and believe me, I grew up a Catholic, but mm-hmm. if I ever right. questioned the authenticity, the reality of Jesus Christ. And I tell somebody, you know, what if Jesus Christ didn't exist after all? And this could be simply a retelling of the Horus mythology, because we have, as you said at the beginning, Mordecai and Esther is Marduk and Ishtar. We have mm-hmm. Jesus, Isis, Mary, Osiris mm-hmm. being Joseph. So all mm-hmm. this mythology, yeah. did it transform into this? And did Jesus really exist? Well, this is a very deep subject that I talk with uh, with my apprentices. Um, it's I'm reluctant to just throw out the answer to you, to your listeners, because it's a proper context is necessary. Uh, just like you know, proper use of a, a steak knife is necessary for a young child, right? And many many people who might be listening have been. And I don't mean this as a criticism, it's just the intent of the Illuminati, the Hermeticists, to dumb them down to the point where, you know, our vernacular, our, our communication is on the, like a sixth grade level. And the same thing applies to our minds. Well, that's we why you're not, here, to reverse that trend. Yes, I know, I know. I don't want to hurt anyone, though. I, and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Okay? The, the, pow- the message that we are given in these stories, if you look at them properly through an allegorical lens and understand that literary devices like personification and metaphor and all these things are used, that is powerful. The the truth that one gathers from looking at these stories through an allegorical, metaphorical lens of personification is mind-blowing. And this is why they've been repeated over and over and over. Asu is who was <laughs> okay, Mel? All right, do it, let's, Scott. Let's, let's let's talk about it. Okay, when we when we understand who he was, we can be free. He told us. He said that he has come to set the captives free. What was he? Well, he told us what he was. He said, "I am the way," which is what Jeremiah six sixteen refers to that tells us to take. I am the truth, and I am the life. This is why the Bible says that we are dead, right? Right For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul says we're dead. Uh, Asu, Jesus says we are dead in our sin. These things mean very specific things. It doesn't just mean that we fell, fell from grace and we became a sinning species. No, no, no. It has very, very deep meaning that is specific. And Asu tried to tell us. Those who wrote these words tried to tell us, and he came, he said, I'm the truth, he said, follow me, what did we do? We killed him, did we not? All of the stories, whether it's Kingu, who was the Sumerian son of God, who was killed at the crossing, whose blood was used, whether it's Mithra, Dionysus, Horus, Horus. all these, were killed. They were all killed. Now, Christians have turned this around, or those who established Christianity, I should say, who were largely the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, who Jeremiah 8.8 8 tells us are liars, right? And they are of Elohim, the root of which means to twist. They have changed these things, just exactly like Isaiah 29.15 and 16 says. A long time ago, there were men who met in secret to try to hide their counsel from God, and they turned things backwards. It means upside down, and it means to pervert. But this backward turning of things, it says, will be esteemed as the potter's clay, meaning 
will be looked upon as the foundation of humanity. So if it was twisted backwards, it was turned upside down, then that which we believe today about the foundation, about the creation, about our existence is twisted. What I do is what the Father called me to do many years ago, and that is to unbind people, to untwist these things. Esu came to do this. The truth came to do this. All we had to do was follow. Follow the Son. That's it, period. That was our entire uh, purpose. Follow the follow. Son as in S-U-N or S-O-N? Well, that is where that is where the mystery lies. And I'll, I'll tell you the answer to it in just a minute. Uh, I promise. Sure. But the the twisting of these things is what we have been learning for thousands and thousands of years. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. Look at the book as the Bible. The by bull means to fold or of to. B-I-B-L-E. It means to fold. Our DNA is to fold. Our DNA is also the book. This is why every single book I write, everything I do is entirely uh, proving over and over and over and over in more than a dozen books now, that the entire con- context of the Bible and our existence is genetic, and it's all been hidden from us. What I do is I open the Bible, and in doing so, by developing this new method of exegesis, I am also unveiling the truth about genetics, which, when I get to it in a little bit, is mind Blowing. If your listeners are not taking notes, they better get a pad of paper out and a pencil or pen because nobody else on the planet is going to tell them these things. I promise you. That's a fact. I should, you know, let me, let me get to the thing about Jesus in a second, but I want to tell your listeners something about me that I've, I've not spoken of publicly ever. Okay. So I want them to know these things about me. 20 years ago, and whether they believe in prophecy or not, it doesn't make any difference, okay? They can believe in it or not. I'm just telling you, it is what it is. Twenty years ago, over a period of about five years, I was prophesied over. Different times, different places, these people who spoke a word from the Creator to me did not know me from Adam. During this time, I was privileged to be able to record these things. A couple of them were written down by people I was with. Most of them were recorded. I had totally forgotten about these things. And I was just living my life. Well, at the beginning of this year, in the spring, I was looking for something I needed for my office, and I was going through a bunch of boxes that I had stored, and I came across these cassette tapes. That shows you how long ago it was. (laughs) They were all on cassette tape. I didn't even have... A cassette player in the house. I went to Walmart. They don't sell them. Radio Shack's out of business because everybody buys things online. <laughs> well, I I ordered one off of eBay. I got here about a week later, and I started listening to these tapes, Mel. And I'm telling you, it brought tears to my eyes. I had totally forgotten about these things, but as I went through these, I was just st- – I was stymied. I was stupefied. Everything they said about me 20 years ago has come about. Here are things they told me. And so your listeners can evaluate me through these things, okay? They told me I would be a trailblazer in the coming days. No one else in the world does what I do. Nobody. There's only one person that even comes close, and that is Mauro Bellino who is an Italian man who doesn't speak English, who was hired by the Vatican to translate the Bible. He's the only one that even comes close, but he doesn't use the same method of exegesis I do. They told me that I would be a standard bearer in the days ahead. When you say they, what do you mean? These are the people who are speaking these prophecies over me. Sometimes I would be in a congregation, they would just, you know, several hundred people. I'd be sitting in the middle of the congregation. They would come up to me and say, young man, would you stand up? I have a word for you. And they would speak these things to me. I would, I was very shy at that time and was reluctant to to do it, but I did. And that's, you know, that's how it works. And they told me I would be a standard bearer in the coming days. Well, that's what I've been doing. I've been raising the standard. A standard bearer is also the one who is at the front of the battle. And this is why I suffer 
and I'm not trying to, you know, uh, get anyone to feel sorry for me or anything, but I'm just saying on a daily basis, I get attacked and it's pretty brutal. Uh, I've got hundreds of things that people have done and said to me in this big folder and it's just unbelievable. Before I started this journey, before I started heeding my call, I never experienced that kind of stuff and I was a Christian. I was in the church. I was singing in a band. I was going on mission trips. Never did I experience the kind of attacks I've experienced since I've done this. So I've done that. I've been a trailblazer. I've uh, been a standard bearer. I've, I'm raising the standard so people understand how to research the ancient texts and understand the Bible. And when you do, if you become an apprentice of mine, for instance, at the Inner Circle, you can learn these things. I teach you how to do it. They told me that I would be the key man, that I would unlock things that no one else had ever unlocked. And that's what I've done. I'm opening the book of Daniel. And this is what all my books are about, this, these elucidating things that have been hidden for thousands of years. And they told me I would uncover things that no one else had ever uncovered. And I've done all of these things. These, these were all spoken by different people over a period of about five years. And I've done all these things. And what it actually is, is part of the apocalypse. The word apocalypse means to unveil or to uncover. And they told me that I would do this. And this is, I think, why uh, there's no one else who does this right now. You know, if the Father sends somebody else to do it, that's great because it would take a load off of my shoulders. But he hasn't. And so when I talk, when I share things with people, when I when I explain to you what's been hidden and what the true meaning of these stories are and who the characters are, I, I tell you humbly – for your own good, people, please listen to what I'm telling you because you're not going to get it from anybody else, anyone else. There's a lot of people who are very popular on YouTube and on the Internet and, and all kinds of things, and they have some interesting material, but it's not the, it's not true. There are little bits and pieces of truth mixed in, but it's designed to distract. All these things out there, YouTube, Google, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, on and on, these were perpetrated against you in the media. To keep you blind, it's a fog, which is an old military term, P-H-O-G, to blind the enemy, to keep you from understanding what's happening. Because those who created you want to keep you enslaved. So I just tell your listeners that so they can get a better understanding maybe of Dr. McQuaid, who, who Scott McQuaid is. Okay, I don't do this for accolades. I don't do it for fame. I don't do it for anything like this. I do it because the Father called me to do it and um, – I fasted and prayed when he brought me to a place in my life where he wanted me to be, and I said, okay, I'll do this. So that's who I am. And going back, I don't want you to think I'm you know, diverting from your question about Jesus. I want to go back to that because this is a very important thing. The cycle we are in is a cycle of the sun. Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote a book called Worlds in Collision, and he traced cataclysmic events that were separated by about 3,500 to 3,600 years, many of them. So scientifically, we know this is a true thing. This is a real thing. This, These cataclysmic events are caused by a celestial body. The ancients knew it. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Akkadians, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Hindus, the Hopis, every, they all talk about it. So why don't we talk about it in Christianity? W- what's the deal here? I mean, if the, the, there just come a point in time when it stopped, we don't talk about it anymore, it doesn't happen anymore? No. The reason that they don't talk about it is because they know it's true, and they don't want you to know how to escape it, or what its true purpose is. This celestial body comes every 3,500 years, or every, you can say every three days. Are you talking about Nibiru here? Yes, I am. It goes by different names. It goes by Nibiru. It goes by Planet X. It goes by Wormwood. It goes by the Red Kachina. It goes by um, the Red Dragon. I wrote a book about it called The Red Dragon and the Sheep. It, It is a real thing. It is a sun. The book of – it's either First or Second Peter – tells us that to the Creator, to the Father, 
one day is the same as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So when this celestial body, we're told, comes after three days, rises after three days, the sun rises after three days, we need to be hearing what is said. Because the same story is told in the Bible and about Dionysus and Mithra and, and Kingu and, and Horus and all these. It's all the same. They rise. And we know that it happens after three days, just like Jesus was said to rise from the grave after three days. What is this telling us? Was he not real? Did he not die on the cross, on a physical cross, at the place of the skull? Did he not have a crown of thorns put on his head? Was his side not pierced so his blood could cover our sin? Are you saying, Dr. McQuaid, that these things are allegories? Yes, I am. But the power of the allegory is much more powerful, I mean, it's much more true than what you learn in what Titus 1.14 calls Jewish fables. If I might interrupt you for a second, because I'm, I have this picture in my mind, mm-hmm. and some people have mentioned this to me. If you look at a cross, imagine space, imagine the lower portion being longer than the upper part. Right. Nibiru having a longer elliptical orbit. That's right. We don't see it. Is this why we see it as a cross longer on the bottom and when it comes being red, covering yes. the sins, covering our plane or our planet? Is that well, what you're implying? Here, here's what's, yes. Well, this is why that symbol is used. Because even if you go to the Greek language and you see the, 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 uh, object upon which Jesus was said to be quote-unquote crucified, it doesn't mean a cross. It, it never meant a cross. It's a spike. It's a staros. S-T-A-U-R-O-S. S-T-A-U-R-O-S. It's a spike. It never meant cross. They put a cross in the English translation of the Bible because Francis Bacon, who was a hermeticist, hired by King James, in other words, who was a Freemason, hired by King James to translate the Bible, wanted to put this symbol in there because the mm. hermeticists know of the crossing. It's a cross, it's a, it's an elliptical, or uh, excuse me, it is a uh, transit. It is a transit of a celestial body at the time that the ancients called the crossing. That's what I meant. Yes, absolutely. You're right. And so, but what is, what is going on here? Christians get angry. Christians call me names. They tell me to go kill myself. They tell me I'm the <laughs> son of the devil. They tell me all kinds of horrible things. Let me tell you. Welcome you're my to friend. the club. I, you, I know what you go through, Mel. When you want the truth, you see, you go through the same kind of things that Asu or Jesus went through. He was a man acquainted with grief and sorrows, and he went through the same thing too, and they killed him like they try to kill the truth now. Here's, what this, here's what's going on. The crossing is, the, is, is of the sun, wormwood. Why is it called wormwood? Because wormwood is the most powerful anti-parasitic herb that exists on the planet. It'll kill parasites. Why is it called a, a, a wormwood then? What, do we have a parasite? <laughs> That's exactly what we have. If you read my book called The Tribulation, you'll get a real up-close and personal detailed account of what this is. What we have or what we are? Because we, we are the most parasitic uh, organism on the planet. We are the cancer of the planet, if you will. That is exactly right. And it is because we were made in the image of the worm. This worm is literally what has made us to be in our current form. When the figure – and this goes back to, to touch on this, to, to really get detailed about this. We have to go back now to the Tetragrammaton because this is, this is the crux of all this. It'll help, it'll help you understand Jesus. It'll help you understand the crossing. It'll help you understand the parasite and all of these things that have been hidden. The figure in Genesis chapter 2 that took man from the ash, right, is known only – in the oldest text that we have as YHVH or YHWH, however you want to say it. yod heh vav heh in the Hebrew. That's it. It's not a name. There are no vowel markings in that those letters called the Tetragrammaton in the Greek, which means simply four letters. They don't exist. Hebrew is an abjad language. It's a consonant-based language. And in a consonant-based Abjad or Abugida language like Mandaic and others, you have to have what is called Nikud, 
N-I-Q-Q-U-D, within the consonants to tell you how to pronounce the consonants. In other words, what vowels should be placed between these. In the oldest texts we have, there are none. There are none. They don't exist. Not until the Middle Ages did the rabbis and the Jewish scribes, which Jeremiah 8, 8, by the way, tells us are liars, take it upon themselves, take it upon themselves to arbitrarily put nekud, or vowel markings, within this tetragrammaton. It was a bad, bad thing that they did. So that's how they get the name Yahweh or Jehovah. They manufactured it. But those are only four letters. So I was, I was in seminary and, you know, all my education, as you know, Mel, we've talked about this before, mm-hmm. uh, was Christian, Christian grade school, Christian high school, Christian seminary, Christian college, all this. And I would ask questions. What does this mean? Why is man created two times? One in Genesis 1, one in Genesis 2. What does the tetragrammaton mean? How could it be Jehovah Yahweh when there's no vowels? And never did I get an answer. I sat under some world, uh, class scholars at Asbury University and other places. They don't, t- they couldn't tell me. They, you know, it's so frustrating because I knew what I was looking at in my Bible study and it was not Yahweh Jehovah. So what is it? What are these four letters? What do they mean? Well, the Father showed me through fasting and praying and through doing exegesis on these letters what it means. So let's go back to the story in the Sumerian. We've got Adam in the Sumerian. We've got Adam in the Bible. We've got Eden in the Sumerian. We've got Eden in the Bible. We've got Adam being made in clay pots in the Sumerian. We've got Adam being made by a potter in the in the um, Bible. Why would the name of the creator of Adam in the Sumerian not be the same in the Bible? It is. When I looked at this deeply, and I studied these four letters, I took a verse very seriously in Isaiah 29, 15, and 16 that I mentioned before. It says that these men turn things backwards. Backwards. And I knew that I'm here to make things right. I'm here to make the path straight. I'm here to put you on the proper road to find rest for your soul. That's my, that's my call. So I looked at these letters and I thought, well, what are they backwards? And I, you know, Y H W H is, is not anything backwards. It doesn't mean anything. So I said, well, how do I do this, Father? And I took Jeremiah 6, 16 seriously. It says, seek the ancient paths, wherein is the good way, where you'll find rest for your soul. Well, what's the most ancient language path? The cuneiform. It's older than Sanskrit. Don't let anybody fool you. So I looked at these letters and I thought, well, how do I get to the Sanskrit, excuse me, to the cuneiform from the Hebrew? Why? Well, I made a progression. I took the letters from the Aramaic, the language that preceded Hebrew, and I transliterated the YHVH into IAUA. That's what they translate as in the Aramaic. I A U A. And I thought, okay, I'm getting somewhere. This looks good. I then took the verse seriously that they had taken these things and turned them backwards. So I turned it back around. And I got A U A I. And guess what? That just so happens to be the vowels exactly of the name of the creator of Adam in Genesis chapter 2, or excuse me, of the name of the creator of Adam in the Sumerian texts. And that is the Anunnaki. A-N-U-N-A-K-I. Anunnaki. That is one and the same as the one Christians call Jehovah Yahweh the Lord God. Those translations don't even make sense until the Jewish rabbis and lying scribes put the nichud, the vowel markings, into those letters in the Middle Ages. Uh, and years you're now. implying Anunnaki as plural as well? Yes. Good. Yes, absolutely. And so I looked at this and I thought, well, okay, so it's the same, Anunnaki. The Anunnaki were the potters and the... Uh, or the Put at, or made Adam out of, in the clay pots in the Sumerian, uh, Enuma Elish, and the Anunnaki are really the ones who are, are the potters in the Bible, uh, who made Adam and put him into Eden. So what does this mean? Well, I know from my study of the Sumerian text that the Enuma Elish, the, the Sumerian creation epic from which the Christian epic came, uh, calls these Anunnaki very specifically the fallen. And those who came from heaven, who, who from heaven to earth came, the fallen ones. 
And I know that there's only one other individual in the Bible who's called the fallen, and that is Lucifer. If you read the book of, uh, it's either Isaiah or Ezekiel. How thou art fallen, Lucifer. Lucifer was the one who rebelled, who fought in a great war against the Father, and was perfect until iniquity was found in them. What's interesting is when you take the root of the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-V-H, which is Chava, and you take the root of the word Eve, the one who was made out of Adam, which is Chava, it's the same thing. And it also means to fall. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we were literally made by the fallen ones. I have shown copious amounts of evidence to support this in the language, even from the Bible. Uh, you, you don't ever find this information by simply using the hermeneutic of biblical exegesis that's given to pastors uh, in seminary. It is an impossibility. They have an improper context. And the reason they don't find these things by using their system of hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation, right, that they're taught in seminary and Bible school, is because hermeneutics was never designed to get them to the truth. It was made by the hermeticists. It's based on the figure Hermes, who was the fallen one, who is the primary figure within Freemasonry and the Illuminati. That's why it's called hermeneutics. It was named after that figure. The methods I'm teaching my apprentices at the Inner Circle to take the words in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic and others and go back to the logograms, the pieces of words in the cuneiform, is the standard that I am raising. It is a standard that I was shown by the Father through a lot of years of research and that I've used to get to the place I am today. And this this may be disconcerting to people that we were made by the fallen. However, this is the purpose of the cycle. That creation of man, if we go back to Genesis 2, is when, at that point, is the point when the worm was put into us, the parasite was put into us. You see, a parasite needs something very specific to, to live. Okay? It is called nucleic acid. And without nucleic acid, a parasite, think of an angel that is sexless, like the Bible insinuates. They can't procreate. In order for a virus or a parasitic virus to procreate, it needs nucleic acid. Has to have it. And this is why they needed the rib. Okay? Because the rib that was taken from Adam is a hidden reference to ribonucleic acid. The parasite or the parasitic virus that was attached to this rib or ribose, which is one half of your DNA, is called a phosphate molecule which is the other molecule that makes up the other half of your DNA. But before phosphate is oxygenated, think of a fallen angel coming into the oxygenated environment of Earth. Okay, Before a phosphate is is oxygenated, it it is called phosphorus, which is the Greek word for the planet Venus, which in the Latin was called Lucifer. So this is the thing that is the parasite, which is attached to the ribonucleic acid, or the RNA, called the rib of Adam in the Bible. It is literally a parasite, which is the purpose of wormwood. Wormwood is the anti-parasitic. It is the sun. The sun, called Jesus, called Mithra, called Horus, called uh, Dionysus, called Kingu, called all these different names. The sun is the Redeemer. It is the Emancipator. Think of it as, think of yourself as being pawned. We are pawns in the hands of the government. 
we work, we slave, we pay taxes, all these kinds of things. And when you're pawned, you sit on the shelf, you got a number, you got a tag on you, right? Say you go into a pawn shop and you pawn a ring, and that pawnbroker puts it on the shelf and it accumulates interest. Well, until it's redeemed, it will sit there and accumulate interest. That's what's called the sin debt. The logograms in the cuneiform, which secretly refer to the phosphate molecule, mean literally to make a loan or to levy a tax. When you go to the Greek word, which is a hidden reference to the ribose molecule in the, in the Greek, which is Christos, the, or Christ, the root of that literally means to pay a debt. When these two molecules were merged together like Daniel says they were, it says they will mingle their seed with the seed of men, but they will not cling to one another like miry clay does not cling to iron. And when they were mingled together, this created sin, literally. Again, this has been turned around like it says it would be in Isaiah 29 and 16 and turned backwards. Sin is not what we've been told it is. Sin, you know, we're taught that sin is hate, uh, murder, stealing, all, you know, the whole long list of all these things. That's not sin. Are those things terrible? Of course. Should we avoid doing them? Yes, absolutely. They're terrible for us. They're terrible for humanity. But sin, that's not sin. Those things are not sin. Those are outgrowths of sin. So what is sin? You say, Dr. McQuay, you, you're changing everything that I ever knew to be true. Well, it's because the book was sealed up until the time of the end, and I'm telling you the truth now. Well, keep it sealed, because we have to separate this segment with the other one, and you're going to unseal that book again for us. And as I'm looking at all these planets and their names, you know, during Greek times, we had Zeus, Cronus, Uranus, Poseidon, then we change into Jupiter, Saturn, Calus, Neptune, and then what we see today, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. All this allegory, all this representation of all these planets, it's personified into into a living being. And this is the part that I'm still, I want to dissect a little bit more when we get back, and so much yes. more when we come back with Dr. Scott McQuaid. Dr. McQuaid, how can people buy your books and learn more about your work and uh, your teachings? Well, please, uh, by all means, um, you'll learn a great deal. Go to paxionpublishing.com, P as in Peter, A-X-E-O-N, publishing.com. And there's a nice discount set up for you there, too, also. Excellent, folks. Don't go anywhere. So much more to discuss when we come back. This is Mel Fambergas, and you are listening to Veritas. Don't go anywhere. Thank you for listening to the first segment of this very important Veritas interview. If you enjoyed it and wish to listen to the rest, go to VeritasRadio.com, click on Members, or subscribe. Or tell someone else who will enjoy this and all our radio programs. If you are listening on YouTube, like, subscribe, and share it. Don't forget to visit the Veritas store, where you can purchase pure organic sulfur, and much more. Now, we'll take a short intermission, listen to some music, and I'll see you in the Veritas member section. Enjoy. Enjoy. 